Good evening, everyone. Thank you very, very much for honoring our invitation. Thank you for joining us for this event, um, which we have tagged Furthering Black Women in Higher Education and Careers. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Emilia Onyema. I'm the Pro-Director Learning and Teaching here at SOAS. And this event is part of our Black History Month events. And um, I'm in charge of uh, our learning and teaching um, portfolio and, and, and section at SOAS. And um, I'm very pleased to, to, to welcome you to, to, to this event. Um, the, this particular event, what we plan to do is, with the help of the, these three amazing, awesome w uh, Black women uh, that we have on the panel, to explore how we, from our own uh, personal experience or experiences, navigate the workplace and, and education while retaining our authenticity as, as, black, as black women in the UK. And we, we will uh, take this opportunity to honor um, black women who have been pioneers in this space in helping to break down barriers and explore going forward uh, the future, how we can support uh, the future generation. And so uh, I've been asked to say to those of you who are media, social media savvy, uh, to please, um, use hashtag at source or at source alumni or at we are source uh, and to to tweet and do all the other wonderful things you do with social media about this event and so i'd like to introduce um, my panelists this evening and uh, before I introduce them, I'm just going to sort of quickly tell, tell us what the structure of the, the evening would be. We're, we're going to have about 25, 30 minutes of discussions. It will be relaxed, you know, sit back re, uh, discussions. I'm going to throw some questions at our panelists and they would speak from their own experience and their own uh, views, following which we will come to answer questions so please if you do have questions just go ahead post all of that in the chat for the benefit of everybody attending we'll try and deal with some of those questions and we're hoping that we would it, it would be a little bit co controversial because you know if it is not very controversial it's usually not very exciting so so ask very serious um, and important uh, questions we'll try to 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 deal with that so the details, full CVs and bios of our speakers, we placed those, their web links on the chat so that you can click through and, and you can then read up a little bit more about our speakers. So I'm going to just give one or two sentences about each of the awesome ladies uh, in front of me. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Zainab Badawi. You all know her. Uh, Zainab is uh, a Sudanese British international broadcast, uh, broadcast journalist. Uh, her connection with SOAS, every one of these ladies went to school in SOAS, so we're very, very proud of each and every one of them. So, so Zainab uh, obtained her master's degree in Middle East history and anthropology at SOAS, and she is the chair of the Royal Africa Society. Then we have Lavinia, uh, Stenner, who is a historian, writer, and she recently graduated from SOAS with a BA in African Studies and Development Studies. I'm sure you've all been hearing about her lately. Uh, and um, she is the founder and CEO of the Black Curriculum. I saw her on TV the other day and I was like, I think I've seen this face before. So I think I'm correct. Yes, she was in SOAS. And of course, we have uh, Busisiwe Dei, who is a lecturer at the Department of Jurisprudence at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Anybody who's been following what our stories and what's been happening in SOAS knows that we're getting stronger connections with, with South Africa. Uh, and our director who starts in January we, we basically poached him from South Africa. So it's just a simple joy to, to, to have Busisiwe on the panel with us. 
But that's not all. She is also a commissioner for, gen for the Commission for Gender Equality in, Southern Afri in South Africa. And of course, remember I said every one of them went to SOAS. So she got an, her MA in Gender and Law from SOAS. And I teach in the law school, so, so there's some connection there. But I, I heard her speak and I was completely blown away. And, and I said to Stephanie, we must get Busisiwe to come in and, and, and do some, uh, to speak for us. So that's the panel we have. So uh, ladies, um, can I just give you one word each, if you want to say a sentence to, to welcome um, um, our participants and our guests? and then I'll start firing the questions at you. Um, should we start with, um, with Zena? Well, hello everybody. Thank you very much, Amelia. Hello, Bissisiwe and uh, Lavinia. And uh, it's great to uh, be with you all and sharing this uh, event. And as uh, somebody who, as you say, did my master's degree at SOAS, I'm always happy to be with the SOAS community and beyond and i'm already looking at some of the messages we're getting here why do we only celebrate african history in the month of october totally with you whoever mm -hmm. asked that i mean it, we should just be part of the mainstream absolutely thank you so very much zena what's this away uh thank you everyone thank you very much uh it's great to be included in events from soas um it was a wonderful experience and i'm hoping to contribute to the conversation and hopefully we will leave, um, all of us will leave all um, enriched with the conversation and with the panelists that we have here today. Great, thank you so very much. Lavinia? Uh, you are still, you're not, yeah. Oh my goodness, guys. It's okay, we have to have that, you know, it's normal these days. Please go on. Honestly, hi Amelia, I'm Busisiwe and Zainab, um, and hi everybody. Um, I didn't expect to be back so soon, but it's really nice to be back. Um, and just, yeah, just really excited for this conversation to learn. So, yeah, hi. Great. Uh, and and so, so to our participants, that's a nice way of just checking that our mics and uh, videos are all working and you can hear us very clearly. So thank you very much, ladies. So I'm going to start with my first question and, and I would ask um, Lavinia to please start, kick us off. And so the, the question I want to ask is in, in just a few words, if you tell us a little bit about yourself, and your academic journey and what it's been like for you as a black woman in the UK. Okay, so my, my name is Lavinia Stenner, um, I'm 23 and I just graduated from SOAS um, studying development in African studies and currently my work is the black curriculum so I've been found, I've, yeah, I've been running it for the last two years um, and within that, we're teaching young people black histories in the UK because at the moment in schools, um, black history is not a part of the national curriculum and young people are missing out on an essential part of British history, right? So we're providing that information. Um, my academic journey didn't start with SOAS. It started whilst I was in college. Um, so I went to South Thames College, which is in um, Merton, for two years. And within that, I chose A-levels that were really kind of arts focused um, because my passions has always been in like drama and art and I think um, kind of going into that environment was really good for me because it was yeah it enriched me with like wider knowledge that I think studying law and the humanities just don't always kind of provide um, but obviously that's not kind of well yeah arguably um, but that was something that was contested um, when I was actually in um, uni and I started to actually go to lectures so I was um, going to like LSE um, UCL to actually kind of learn about um, just different subjects around women, around poverty, and I think um, it was there that sparked my interest in actually the theme of decolonization. Um, that was my first kind of entrance point into the edu into that kind of um, debates and like education. And I felt that there was a strong part, um, you know, to play within what we learn as as young people, but also the truth. Um, so that kind of inspired me to go to Zoas. Mm -hmm. um, study African studies and throughout the academic journey I think what's been important to me is finding out um, finding through um, 
yeah, finding through all my kind of colleagues and, and also teachers, um, the ability to express a lot of empathy and emotion because coming back to those arts, the, the, the reason that I really like the arts is because it allows you to kind of have a wider discussion. You can bring in yourself. Um, and I think, yeah, just kind of being with lecturers such as Ida and, and Kojo um, and Shege over the years, there was a lot of, um, I guess, room for me to really express my identity um, in connection to African studies. So I think like that, that part of empathy is really important to play. Um, and it's, yeah, it's helped me in my academic career to kind of bring in that creative side. Um, that I think for so long was just separated. It's like you have your arts and you have the humanities and they don't come together, but it's all one. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, so this is Siwe. What is it like being, what's, be, what's it been like for you um, as well, your academic journey? Well, um, my academic journey has been quite interesting because it was the result of my inability to integrate my career path, which was law, and to settle within that space uh, with comfort. And a lot of my interactions with black academia and interacting with academics um, who are black actually was solidified at SOAS. Um, I always say to people, it's actually hilarious that a lot of my work as a black feminist scholar um, really was cemented through engaging with SOAS because you know, um, within the South African context, there had been relatively very little change in terms of how the curriculum is structured. And I found that I had more space to broaden my horizon, as it were, within the legal space um, as a Black academic. Um, and it, so it's been a very... Um, I would say antagonistic experience because even within the legal spirit field, it's still structured in a way that assumes that the uh, types of professionals that will be types of professions that will be entering the legal field are predominantly white in terms of the practices, in terms of how the field is structured, the traditions and the practices. So it, it has been coming back and bringing all that knowledge and bringing all that activist work. A lot of my um, protest work carried on into SOAS as well. Uh, Roads Must Fall, transitioning to Roads Must Fall in, in, at SOAS and through you know, um, at the UK chapter of Roads Must Fall. So it's been sort of like straddling and having a quote unquote failed legal career and moving into activism and activist spaces and developing and finally accepting that I belong in academia as well. So it's, it's it, it being now in, in the institution itself, it's been interesting to find ways of creating the space that I didn't have in academia that I didn't think was possible um, and how it sort of, you know, sort of, you know, came full circle. And I became, and I have become invested in creating the spaces that I didn't have whilst I was a student, whilst I was a professional. So it's, it's been sort of a bittersweet sort of transition and, and experience in that developing a career that you know, sees and, 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 and gives voice to black women academics as well. Wow, thank you so very much. I, I, I was wondering how many more sentences before I hear the word protest. If not, I, I would start doubting you people's heritage, SOA's heritage. Zena. Thank you very much, Amelia. Lovely to listen to both of you, Lavinia and Amelia. Lavinia, I won't be saying my age as you did at the beginning. <laughs> You can only do that when you've got a two in front of your age. And um, Mr. Siwa, I'm a little bit like you. You say you, you know, failed legal career. I mean, I have a failed medical career. I always wanted to be a doctor. Many, many doctors in my family. And I always thought until about the age of 16 that I would go into medicine. And then I found there was a bit of an obstacle in that. I couldn't really stand the sight of blood, which was... Um, you know, a, a bit of a disadvantage, let's put it that way. So, um, yeah, I went to school here in London and then I did my first degree at Oxford University. Um, I studied philosophy, politics and economics. 
and then I did my master's degree um, in history and anthropology at uh, SOAS. So when we're talking about um, women in academia, um, you know, when I was at Oxford, uh, there were less than five, you know, fewer than five of the students were female for a start. So one in four and a half or so were women. Um, women of, of color, tiny amount. Um, black women like me, even smaller. Um, women academics, very few in the university as a whole. Black women academics, non-existent. So things have got better for women in academia. I went to an all women's college at Oxford because that was my age, you know, the colleges were all, um, you know, female or male. I think a couple had gone mixed the, the year I'd gone up. But what was good for me going to an all women's college was at least we were surrounded by women in positions of power, academics, um, the principal was a woman. And so that actually was fairly empowering for me. So not black women, but at least women in academia was something that resonated with me because of my college at Oxford. And then also you could describe female education as my family business back in the Sudan, because my great grandfather was the pioneer of girls education in the Sudan. So I grew up with aunts, um, you know, great aunts who would be in their 80s now, and they have PhDs from Western universities, you know, women in my family who would be well over 100 now who were totally literate, could read and write. And imagine, you know, this is at a time at the turn of the last century when the vast majority of women were illiterate. So when it comes to women in academia or women in education, for me, it's, you know, something which is almost second nature. And I think that's always informed what I have done. So although I chose a career in broadcasting and in news and current affairs, I would say that the work that I have found the most satisfying is the work in education that I've done in the media, um, particularly this History of Africa series about which I will tell you more. Very good. Great. Carry on. Great, thank you. Uh, and it's always nice when you have an academic event to throw some data out there. I know that we already shared some data uh, on the Twitter feed and on the website. But it's, um, there's an exhibition of black female professors in UK university that is ongoing currently. Uh, and it, it, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Uh, and um, it, it's um, about, they, they showcase 35 um, female, black female professors in UK universities, higher education institutions. And I'm really very proud of the fact that I can actually say that SOAS can lay claim to three. And that is huge if you, if you recognize that we have over 100 universities in the UK and we have only 35 black female professors and the school of law that I belong to, uh, we can lay claim to two, Farida Banda and Diamond Ashiagbo who's left us. And then school of finance and management, they have Kemi Yekini. Uh, it, it's amazing work. Um, maybe we just don't sing or, 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 or showcase what um, the, the contributions that SOAS is making in, in, this, in this field but for me personally, one of the best student feedbacks that I have ever received must have been from a black female student of mine who said that uh, she, was, she felt so proud being a black woman because she was being talked by another black woman. Uh, that is just being, you know, you get some of those feedback and you're like, wow, okay, I didn't really realize uh, that how impactful this can be. And that's what you've said to us, Zina, the idea that you had uh, women that you could look up to. It's not, the, the, all the women in your life were also strong and powerful and successful in their own right. 
as women. I think that is massively important. And that's one of the things we want to achieve as well going forward to showcase uh, that there are lots of very powerful, uh, very successful black women um, out there. And so Zena, Abu, how has this journey impacted your work and career? You started talking a little bit about that. So we just carry on with that and then I'll come back to Busisiwe and Levin. Which journey is that, Amelia? Well, Sorry. Well, your academic journey. So, 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 you know, your experiences at SOAS, uh, at, at, at Oxford, and your person being a black woman, the influence of your aunties, great yes. aunties, and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I've always thought of um, women and, of course, black women as belonging in the um, academic world, be it in schools, be it in universities, but also, you know, in, in professional life. So I suppose, you know, from the minute, from the get go, it, it kind of gave me a certain confidence and that it's only now that I look back on it that I see actually, um, you know, I probably, I, I can't even remember another black woman at Oxford as an undergraduate, to be perfectly honest with you, there was some, Brits of Asian origin, there were mixed race, but uh, a couple, well, one mixed race woman I can think of, but it, it didn't, it didn't make me feel, oh, you know, that I was disadvantaged. I think because I had grown up in this kind of milieu. So that makes me think that role models are very, very, very important. And so the absence of um, black women academics i think it is a problem and it is something that we all need to do something about um one way or another and i i know that we're going to discuss you know perhaps uh, positive ways that we can bring this about but i i think um you know i would have liked to have gone into academia perhaps you know i only did a master's degree i don't have a phd like you so I, I couldn't go into academia. It's too, too late for me now to try and embark on a PhD. I, PhD. I'd be 106 by the time I finished it. But um, I, I think that, that that kind of tradition of education is something that stayed with me for my whole career. And I, I was never really interested in the, um, you know, light entertainment part of broadcast journalism or you know it was always the more educative informative side that's um, really you know motivated me great this is the way. same question so you know the impact of your academic journey on on your own on your career your work, um yeah. sorry i'm taking notes as as, as Zena <laughs> is talking so that's why i look <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um i wanted to you know um you know echo some of the sentiments um, um Zainab has just you know articulated so well but i think that oftentimes i have to take a step back and i i have to re uh, or question you know, the overemphasis on, you know, representation and, you know, um, having people who look like us, which is very important, um, occupy, you know, traditionally white institutions. My university that I currently um, teach was um, created to teach white males, mm. particularly white Africana males. So it is an institution that was, is structured to you know specifically exclude people like me and it's very important then that we address the institutional um, practices and traditions that are that exist within all these institutions that often embed and cement um, exclusion mm -hmm. um, i found that with a lot and and i, I keep on bringing it back to my context is that and 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 is that a lot of my students who are coming into the university this is the first time that they have met a black 
queer woman who is a lecturer, for instance. And for them, it, you can see it when I enter into class, I do dress a bit sort of like not my age. So the first time I'm often mistaken for one of them. And, you know, last year I had bleached hair. So it was a, really a very um, new experience for them that a lot of them would come to my office tentatively, fearful. I had to encourage them to actually, you know, um, come for consultation and ask me questions. There's, so the point that I'm trying to make is that often these institutions, we might see our presence as progressive, but we don't understand that these institutions themselves are built on the premise of our exclusion. And so it has been important for me to have that in mind whilst also, you know, actively uh, being part of my students' uh, experience and, 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 and ensuring that even the curricula and the readings that I prescribe um, speak to their own experiences. Uh, this is the first time that they're speaking about gender-based violence, they're speaking about their own positions and interactions with the law from a very personal space. And I use the personal as a very important space of knowledge for particularly for my black women um, students. And so I think that it is about understanding the institutional um, aspect of these practices and how they create an environment of marginalization and an exclusion. And although it's important for me to be present um, uh, physically, but I think it's also important the undoing of the institutionalized uh, ways in which, you know, a lot of my students are excluded. Um, I, you know, a simple example is moving between, you know, I speak four languages. So I move between four indigenous languages and English. And for a time, that was a sort of very confusing space for a lot of my white students because they felt excluded. And to use that as a moment of um, education and say, well, this is because this whole institution is structured towards ensuring that you feel part of this institution. And so it's been sort of trying to navigate the institutional and understanding the broader institutional forms of exclusion that are beyond the individual, yeah. but also understanding my own uh, purpose and presence as part of creating an institution that is exclusive um, and, 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 and to particularly black women and, and having them understand that this is them, this is their space as well. Yeah. well that, that's really very interesting. Lavinia. Thanks. Um, I think just, yeah, just really to capitalise off what was said before, I think there's a lot of foresight um, and it's a good kind of foresight when you know that there is a black woman um, who's going to be your, your teacher, your lecturer, your, um, your mentor, because there is that, that understanding that, you know, you're going to be supported on your journey and empowered. Um, I think it's just a given. It's just a fact um, for me. Um, but then I'm also really careful about that foresight because within that, um, as um, Basiba mentioned, you, you do have these institutional factors which, um, you know, the premise of them, it favours only a few. And so sometimes when you're entering into these environments, there's this perception of like, well, if I'm here, no one else can be here. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, it's really understanding the class background, understanding the perception of that black woman as well, because I think it's just not a case of just representation on, on, the, on the lens of kind of like just skin color. I think it has to be deeper than that. Um, but then having said that as well, I do think that there is um, a particular um, foresight, yeah, that is also grounded in um, also recognizing that they are overworked. There's a lot of work, there's a lot of expectations. And so sometimes even if I'm coming in to feel empowered and kind of to make that connection, I also have to recognize that they're here to work, right? And there's a duty there too. So it's just understanding the boundaries, um, which sometimes is not always clear. Um, but for the most part, I do feel a lot, I, I still feel a lot more empowered when I'm around black women um, in, inside of the academy, whether it's work um, or having a mentor. Um, and it just gives me the opportunity to build. So yeah, it's a good thing. Great. 
Um, th this is really helpful. So, so can I ask all the panelists uh, to please also keep an eye on the chat because lots of questions and comments and you're already picking up on some of the possible answers to some of the comments. So I'm, I'm going to stick with Lavinia and, as we move on to the, um, to the next question, and which is again looking to the future. So, so because we're going to go to the question, and um, for now I'm just going to ask you just one thing. What do you think would be one action that you think will help further the careers of black women, whether in academia or in other careers? Just one, one practical thing, that action that you think um, we can do. I think within, yeah, I think within wider society, there's a recognition that when black women work, you know, there are clear results, you know, we know what we're doing. Um, we're very kind of um, focused on the goal and we also include the community in that process. So I think there's a, an awareness that the work that we do is transformative, it, you know, it's intergenerational. So there's a lot within that. But what I don't see a lot of the time is support between women. So for example, like white women supporting black women, amplifying the work that they do. Um, finding out how to support each other. I feel like there could be a lot more um, upliftment, up, uplifting um, between each other um, and raising awareness because at the end of the day, like, um, you know, it is, it is kind of a rat race, but um, we are better and stronger together. Um, so I would like to see much more women kind of like intentionally amplify, you know, other women in their spaces and kind of, um, you know, if, even if it has nothing to do with your own work, just recognize like, what it takes to get there, do you know what I mean? Because we've all been through it, so yeah. I think that's, that's actually quite powerful, this whole idea of women first, before we then begin to think, okay, yeah, I'm a white woman, or I'm a black woman, or I'm a green woman, or whatever color the person is. And so I, I work in international arbitration, and one of the things, uh, we, 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 there's a lot of work being done on diversity and moving the, you know, moving um, the, the, the barriers or removing them so that initially started with more women can get involved. And then after a while, you sort of pause and you look at who the women are and it's all white women. And it's like, okay, hang on. Some of us are in this space as well. We're black women. What, where is that generic women? So I think I, I, I very much agree with that. So, so, so support women, you know, whether white, black, in that same space. We, we do need to recognize that. Great. What's this away? What um, I'm going to, perhaps this is one of the moments that... Um, um, that will be controversial, but um, I know, you know, there is a, a sense of not wanting to uh, create uh, or recreate segregated spaces, mm -hmm. but I, you know, that's been a question that occupies or has been in my mind as a fresh academic mm -hmm. um, and, and somebody who wants to create a career that is, you know, goes, you know, decades um, into the future and, you know, really, you know, creating spaces that are centered around black women only. And it's, 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 it, and, and it's very important because as Lavinia has said, um, I find, you know, depths of inspiration um, and, 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 and I find myself, um, you know, uh, supported within spaces where um, black, I am able to talk to black women both above and below me, you know, in terms of generationally in, in, in the career, in, in the academic career space. And I think that we should lean into this idea of creating spaces that where we can, you know, um, have these conversations between us and support us um, and, and be intentional about, you know, creating spaces that are only for black women. And I think institutions should be clear that in supporting these black only spaces, it's not um, premised on exclusion, but really fostering an environment where black women are, 
do feel safe, do feel that they have these networks and resources that they can draw from. I think the, the, the biggest difficulty for me has been creating a network of support um, where you know, I have people who understand my experiences, who understand what I mean when I say that um, I am experiencing racial microaggressions. And you know, the institutionalized racism um, the nature of it is not explicit, um, but it is in the ways in which expectations about management of admin and work um, are, are, you know, we are measured at a higher level in terms of the, the productivity and the work that we produce without consideration of the intersectional issues and backgrounds that we have. I do not have come from a family that is academically inclined. My mother was a nurse and she is one of the first people to have a tertiary education in our family. My dad was a taxi driver. And so I don't have the experience of you know, academia. And it for me, I have had to draw the support and from networks that exist, you know you know, across the continent of South Af of Africa, across South Africa, even in other universities, you know, globally as well from other black women academics who have taken on the role of supporting me. And so I do think that we should lean into the, the, the idea that perhaps, you know, um, empowered segregation is where we need to begin in order to create you know, uh, spaces where women, black women feel confident enough to say, I am creating a career in academia and where I struggle, I can seek out Musisiwe to actually help me understand how I can navigate, you know, balancing the admin portion of my career versus my passions and my PhD proposal. How do I navigate finding a supervisor, for instance, that is in line with my work and my and 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 and, and my values and, and what I'm passionate about? Sort of the small things to the larger things and how you can manage a career are very important. And I think that part of that is developing strong networks of support and asking for help and saying, how do I publish? How do I write an abstract that will be um, 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 accepted? You know, from the simple small things that seem sort of, you know, as a matter of cause to people who have, you know, existed traditionally within the space to people who are first generations like myself, who I can't go to my father or my mother to, to ask these questions or even ask for support. I do think that perhaps a practical step is empowered segregation. It's a very clumsy way of formulating it, but empowered segregation where we develop these networks with the intention of fostering young academic minds and young black women who see academia as a potential space that they can create and foster change um, and, and have impactful contributions in, in their fields of study. Great. Thank you so very much. And if it's um, just to say that there is such a group um, within the UK, uh, it's a new group that has just been formed on uh, to help with aspiring female academics, inspiring female academics and all of that. And one of the super women in SOAS, uh, Kemi Yekini, one of our female pro black professors, she, she's leading uh, one of the leaders of that network. I'm going to quickly go to, to Zainab so we can get her one bang tip and then we would move on to Q&A. So I, I, yeah, I agree with, uh, with uh, everything that's been said. Uh, um, you know, Lavinia, you said women and men. I mean, I think that what we need to do is to see where um, black women um, suffer um, prob discrimination problems, have disadvantages as a result of their gender, something they share with white women 
and Asian women, you know, where it's gender specific and that might be, um, you know, not enough black women are promoted in STEM subjects or computer science or whatever, which is something that affects all women. And then where it's more specific to their race and then they're no different from black male academics. So I think in order to solve the problem, you've got to really decouple where black women academics suffer as a result of their gender or as a result of their race and then deal with that appropriately and it may mean that at times they have to ally themselves with white women and at other times they'll have to ally themselves with black men because it's you know it's a function of race i think the idea of networks that Bruce seaway mentioned is very very important and i think just not only within country but across countries um, I, a plug here, shamelessly, I just made, a, you know, 20 one-hour programs about the history of Africa, um, mm -hmm. traveling 32 African countries mm -hmm. over a period of six years. I spoke to dozens and dozens and dozens of African academics because this is Africa's history told by Africans themselves. Mm -hmm. And amongst them, I always sought out women academics. And I have to say that some of the finest minds are these African female academics. Mm -hmm. They are there. It's just they are denied the international public space. And I think that we ought to have networks that transcend um, countries. And, you know, if you've got nothing better to do, all of you out there, go onto the BBC Africa YouTube channel, um, you know, 15 episodes are on this Sunday, the next five will be going on, and you'll see two of the finest women experts on the transatlantic slave trade as it happened, you know, talking. So I think that, you know, they're out there. And the third thing I would say about um, women ac academics and empowering them is, you know, it, it, what they suffer in academia is not different from the discrimination they suffer in other sectors be it you know in finance be it in the city there's nothing peculiar about black women in academia um you know they suffer discrimination across many many sectors but where it is different in academia i think not just for black women but also black men is the nature of the curriculum and that's something that lavinia will talk about i'm sure but the curriculum is largely designed by um you know non-african non-asian and it does reflect a particular view of the world and so that's an additional challenge that black women in academia have got to confront which is you know we've heard about it decolonizing our curriculum and you know the black lives matter conversation has opened up the space as never before to talk about you know who is in the driving seat of how we see the world Whose story are we are we telling? And I think that when it comes to history in Lavinia, I'm sure you know you'll, you'll speak about this. African history has been denigrated, written by outsiders, or they've been told we've been told we don't have any, which is you know none of this is true. And so I think there is a challenge uh, culturally for women in academia, regardless of what their discipline is, to try to shift this juggernaut. So I would say form the networks mm -hmm. in country, within your universities or regionally or whatever, but also across continents. Ladies, you've been amazing. Thank you so very much. The, the spread of, of, of what we've had to discuss this evening. So there's lots of questions. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to scan through the chat select one question that you're going to deal with. Um, and while, while our panelists are, are dealing with that, um, I want to just let our attendees know that on the chat, we've posted um, the link to the BBC program that um, Zainab just talked about. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's, yeah, 20, on Sunday, the last five go on because they talk about um, the transatlantic slave trade, you know, the scramble for Africa and so on. But there's more to African history than just the transatlantic slave trade. Um, much, much more. And I know it's a passion, it's an obsession of mine, but, you know, it's, 
anyway watch and let me know part of what makes us special uh, and you've all spoken to that this whole idea that what we do we're passionate about we believe in what we do and we bring all of ourselves into what we do which is what 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 helps us excel um should i come back to lavinia so one question from the chat that you want to answer and then i will go to busisiwe and come back to zena and then we will wrap up I, I do apologize if we don't pick your question but people are allowed to do two questions if they want go on lavinia i'm just going to choose one um so the one that I'm, i've chosen is um can you speak about your experience in New Zealand as a black woman and how it influenced my academic pursuits and eventually the creation of the black curriculum? So um, in short, um, traveling to New Zealand um, as a black woman was um, really interesting. I've always kind of been interested in, in kind of traveling. And I think in, in, in doing so, you definitely see um, how, uh, I guess, the the luxury of being able to travel. Um, so that paired with like associations of like status when you have like a British passport and then also being black and how that's kind of met when you go to different countries is really interesting. So when I was in New Zealand, it was, um, I think initially I didn't kind of perceive like um, there was, I guess that there's, there's a perception of me as like, um, like a, a rich kind of Westerner coming in, but I felt very, um, I guess em embraced by a lot of Maoris who understood um, a lot of like uh, black feminist work and so I think from through their perspective it allowed me to kind of connect on that level instead of coming in as like someone who's going to travel and, and see and like do all this tourist stuff um, so in kind of building those connections it was really powerful I, I really credit all my I, I guess inspiration for the black curriculum um, to the women lecturers that were teaching me I was literally in like all okay apart from one of my lectures but most of them were, were run by women um, and a lot of them had this I, I guess like importance of stress of stressing in every class that um, you know women are the carriers of culture and it's really um, I guess down to us to make sure that uh, we are kind of shaping the future for our, you know, our, our next generations and things like that. So I think because it's part of like their education, I was involved in kind of, I guess, downloading a lot of the importance of um, giving, yeah, just nurturing, I guess. And I think with that, it definitely inspired me to make sure that with all of the information around um, teaching and um, empowering empowering women to kind of be at the center of these discussions, I came back to the UK to actually build with other black women who were really interested in building a, a black curriculum. So that's how it started. It started at SOAS. I met with um, Bethany and Lisa, mm -hmm. who were two women that were just interested in building a black curriculum. And we sat down in SOAS and we were just like, like this is, you know, this is the next steps and we've done it. So I think just kind of just being in that environment and soaking it all up really gave me the motivation and I guess the insight. Um, and I think back now, I didn't probably realize it then, but kind of thinking back to, to the practice of what we was trying to do, it is it really is about kind of connecting and like, you know, um, facilitating discussions as women to kind of bring out into the world. So that's like what, you know, happened behind the scenes with the black curriculum. Um, but yeah, I think more importantly, it's about kind of just, articulating our stories and I think even with the teaching of black history it is about centering black women's experiences as well um, because it's it's heavily it's been written by white men um, and even with black history as well like there's yeah there's such a such a, a deep place for us to kind of like break down more more narratives so yeah that's how it's influenced the black curriculum great thank you so very much which question have you chosen to answer I think I'm going to take the question from Melissa. Let me just find it quickly. Um, but it is about, um, uh, though, um, so I think your concept of empowered segregation, though I may not agree with the name, is a concept that I can get on board with. As a young Afro-Caribbean academic, I struggle with ways that I can appropriately empower my Black female students without modular marginalizing other student, students. Is there any advice that you or anyone can share here? I think that part of the practice that I have begun instituting in my classrooms, well, when we had classrooms, was looking for uh, particularly 
you know, uh, articles and works that center the black experience with colonialism and apartheid. And that was something that was lacking. I also teach first year, so it was a struggle to find works that were at their level of comprehension, but were able to present the concept. So this year, I prescribed Ngugi Wa um, uh, you know, a language in African literature. And although it's not, you know, um, in, related to the legal space, but it was an interesting way to explore the concept of language as a device or language as a device of exclusion. And my Black students who come from all over the country, who speak multiple languages, um, were able to latch onto that piece and relate um, to um, Wationgo's, um, 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 you know, writings and really, you know, bring them to their legal work as, you know, future legal scholars. Um, another, art, you know, chapter that I prescribed was um, not really a chapter, but examining Marikana as, a, a, you know, protest action and the historical development of the regulation of black bodies. I mean, you know, my students, I found that my students are able to really take in these big concepts that I thought were insurmountable before, if you relate them to experiences um, that are rooted in, in sort of like their own black experiences. And yes, it does often create a, a sense that other students are excluded. But I think how we also look and understand what exclusion means, uh, often it means not centering whiteness. And I've, all, I've also had to take on the work, and it is emotional work, it is taxing, to have my white students understand that just because this, you know, the curricula and how I've set up the syllabus does not center your experience. Doesn't mean that you're being excluded. It's an opportunity for you to enter and, and understand experiences of, you know, a population that you have been taught um, is not important. I go into examining the geography of South Africa and how the law has been sort of like a very fundamental part of constructing the spaces that we live in. And, you know, my students have surprised me because they completely understand it. Of course they understand it. Um, um, it's because of how you change the the work, it is a struggle to find work that is, you know, understandable at their level. But if you do the work and if you make sure that you're just willing to take them through the steps of understanding that their experiences, the personal is a space of knowledge, the personal is a space of legal inquiry. Um, your students often amaze you, and particularly my black students, you know, they, they've really inspired me in how they, they've just blossomed um, in, in sort of like taking on the law or taking on the law as a space that they thought was not a space that included them and their experiences. So perhaps that's how I would answer that question. Um, it's not easy, it's exhausting, but you know, you just have to change, you know, how you understand who is the subject of knowledge and who is able to produce knowledge and affirm that constantly that their personal experiences are spaces of knowledge. That you know, this university is not a space that is outside of them, but is a space through which they can interpret the experience through their own, you know, interactions with the academic space as well. Great, thank you. If I if I just keep keep listening to you, I will come. I will move over to South Africa and take your course. Uh, thank you. So so Zainab, um, which question do you want to answer? We have less than three minutes. Uh, yeah, I won't be long. Uh, I mean, I've looked at all of them, and I think there's a kind of you know a current running through all the um, questions. So I really just perhaps try to unite them in, in a theme and you know people asking about what do they do if they don't have a mentor or you know how do they try to overcome barriers and so on that look you know i'm a great pan-africanist you know and we are all sitting here we're listening to Busa Siwe in south africa how inspiring is she lavinia of a british caribbean background me born in northeast sudan you amelia and so on that oh, i'm very nigerian 
Nigeria, there you go. I used to be able to say I was born in the Sudan, the biggest country in Africa. You're yeah, no, well, you know. Well. But now we've gone down to number three. Exactly. What can we do with, without yeah. Nigeria? <laughs> what I would say is, you know, if you feel isolated or you feel that, you know, you're in Amelia where you're the only voice, uh, you know, black woman, because as we know, as you said, what, mm -hmm. 700, 700 um black women um, academics in the UK, professors. It's a big world out there. Look, you know, it's, we're having a global conversation now. And I would say that, you know, nurture, foster international links. You know, as I said, I was blown away by these black women academics I encountered in Africa. And, you know, at the click of a button now, you can find uh, people, you know, women who will inspire you, who will share their, um, stories with you. So I would just say to all of you who are asking questions, you know, go out there. Internet means that you can connect with people all over, you know, whether they're in the Caribbean, whether they're in Africa or, or in the United States. If you're a black woman, you're part of a big black diaspora family and also with those on the continent, seek those out and also share knowledge about you know the, the kind of topics that you're dealing with particularly if you're working in the um you know in the social sciences and, and so on that you know the kind of stuff that Lavinia was talking about the curriculum what you know so black women unite across continents to assert yourselves on the social political cultural agendas of whichever country you're in Thank you so very much. And I would say without fear, with all confidence, you're entitled to be in any space and, and you can own that space. And there is absolutely nothing to be afraid of. And, and that's the Nigerian in me speaking, which is, which is, you know, which is great. And so it's left for me to say a huge thank you. Thank you to my wonderful, wonderful, wonderful panelists. Thank you to all the attendees. Thank you for honoring us with your presence, with your questions. Please, if you have any comments, uh, just email us at events at soas.ac.uk. We look forward to welcoming you back to another event. Thank you and have a lovely, lovely evening. And watch the history of Africa. Watch the history of Africa. Please. Thank Africa. you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye, ladies. Thank you. Thank you.